Darlene, hi, welcome to Confidence Conversations. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I am so honored that you, you're here and want to dive into what does confidence mean to you? Okay, that's my first question. What does confidence mean to me? <laughs> Um, you know, I thought a lot about this question, um, knowing that we were going to be talking about confidence today. And I guess it, it kind of reminds me of when I think about confidence, I think about just the courage to be yourself, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing things, even though you're scared, you know, it's like, you know, when kind of talking about that, that courage isn't not being afraid of things, but it's doing it anyway. And I kind of feel the same way about confidence is just kind of, even though there may be something that you are not feeling comfortable with or not feeling that that confident end, you just do it anyway and kind of believe in yourself and believe in your abilities and believe in. Um, and I, I, I think being willing to fail also knowing that you're going to grow no matter what the outcome is. And so I think that's where I think, you know, if you can stay in that space, I think that's where kind of real confidence come, comes from. And at the end of the day, um, sometimes you just fake it till you make it. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you know, you just say, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to put a smile on my face and believe I can do it, even if I don't really believe it. And then somehow that sinks in, you know, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes that's the best thing. That's sometimes that's the best I got in the moment. So no, and it's so true. Sometimes that is the best we have is to like show up and we don't give ourselves enough credit for just showing up and doing the whole fake it to make it like, I know the world is divided on like, should I fake it or should, right. but sometimes you have to show up in places and spaces where you're feeling inadequate, or maybe you're suffering through something like imposter syndrome. And you know that you can or deserve to be in the room, but there's like a little voice inside of you. That's telling you that I can't be here. So you do have to fake it in that moment. And I think that the other part that you mentioned, which is knowing that no matter what happens, even if it's a perceived failure or whatever people want to call it, you're going to learn from it. Yes. That in and of itself instills you with such a sense of, I think, trust and ease in the process. Yes. Because then you know it's not a failure. You know right. that it can't go wrong. It's just, I'm learning life right. is a journey. I'm showing up for it. And yes. it is what it is. <laughs> and trusting yourself to to make it through whatever is going to be in front of you. I mean, I, I, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's one of these quotes of like, you know, every time you think you can't, you know, you're not going to make it through something, just look at your life. Your, your, your track record is hundred percent because you made it to today. So everything that has been really, really hard, you've made it through. So just reminding yourself of that and trusting that whatever is placed in front of me, I will get through it. And I will, you know, like you said, I will learn, I will grow, I'll be better for it, whether it's a huge win or something that I wish I would have done differently, I'm still going to be better for it. So I think that's where um, confidence comes from too. Yeah. And a part of that is really one of the things that you live by. It's all over your website, which is, you know, progressing and evolving as a person. And if we're the same person that we are next year as we are yeah. today, Stagnation is not cool. And I say that all the time. No we, human. Our nature is not to be stagnant. So what does true progress and evolution look like to you? Um, I think every day, just waking up, asking yourself, what can I do better today yeah. than I did yesterday? And sometimes it's really small. Sometimes it's just, you know, it, it, we're not our 100% every day is not the same. And I think that that's really important to think about as well. And to remember is that, you know, sometimes your 100% is just getting in the shower, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and then sometimes you're killing it and that's okay because that's all, you know, hundred percent and having that grace. But I think, you know, true progress is making sure that you're growing, taking the time to slow down in your life and look around and, and make sure that you're spending your time and you're putting the intention into being a better you, no matter what that means. And that means a million different things and it'll mean something different every day, but really, um, yeah, just taking, making sure that you're taking the time every day to just be a little bit better. And it doesn't have to be huge. I mean, a lot of times, you know, when we look at our lives and realize that we've made progress, it's not an overnight thing. You know, we look back and go, oh, wow, a year ago, 
my life looked really different. And I didn't even realize that I, I didn't even realize that I'm here now. Um, and, but it's, that's just an every day of doing just a little something, just a little something, just a little something, just a little, I love that. Just a little something. Cause like there's this another quote that I'm going to butcher, but the days are long and the years are short. So right. much, so much. <laughs> We have to take each day for what it is and assuming that I'm going to be just as good as yesterday or that like tomorrow is going to be better. Like just take this moment, not even the day, this moment. moment. There's a book called The Power of Now. And one of the, the things that it asks you to ask yourself constantly is what is my relationship to now? Mm. You know, and that, and I think, and I say that to myself all the time, just as a reminder of, cause I get ahead of myself and I'm of gold medal overthinker. (laughs) And so, um, and a gold medal worrier. And so, um, you know, that brings me back to the present because this is all we have and being, you know, when we focus that energy and that attention on the now and what we can do now and who I am now, and am I being my best in this moment? Because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and if, or if I'm going to have a tomorrow. So what is this moment and making this moment the best that you can possibly make it. And I think that really helps me sort of stay focused on that. In addition to staying focused though, it gives us so much power, like untapped power and potential because there's so many things like most of our lives are out of our control because it's, it's external. There are external factors that are happening that we don't have, but you have control over what you do right now. And yeah. what you give yourself and how you fill your cup and how you progress. Yes. So there's progressing, right? And then there's your calling and stepping into your power. And right. that you have an incredible story. So tell us about your journey. Um, oh gosh. Um, I guess the journey to the book or the journey. I don't know. Journey to your calling because we will get into the book. My calling. Okay. My journey to my call. Yeah. It's, it's been a a windy road. I think I I decided that I wanted to be a therapist when I was like 14 years old and I never changed my mind. Yeah. Um, I, I knew before that I wanted to be a doctor and then I quickly realized that I'm horrible at science and I don't really like blood. So that wasn't going to work. Um, and then I kind of, you know, realized that I'm, I'm sort of nosy. And people fascinate me. And I just, and I've always, you know, I, and I have this, this, this help helpful thing that I've always had since I was little. And so I was like, yes, I'm going to be a therapist. And I never changed my mind. And I was laser focused on that. And so went to graduate school, got my master's degree in social work. And I chose that path because I also knew that I have so many different interests and Mm -hmm. with a degree in social work, I could work in so many different areas. And so all under the umbrella of being a clinical social worker, but I've worked in a jail, I've worked in schools, I've worked on college campuses, I've worked in a counseling center. Um, And so it's been really fun for me to have like these different variations and facets of my career all under this umbrella of a clinical social worker. So, um, so that's been really fun. And, And so my career again, has been sort of windy. I've moved around a lot. Um, and, and so I've been able to just sort of reinvent myself, um, and, and reinvent my, my, my life and my work, I guess. Um, but I guess really as, so I would say probably around 2019, I had gotten into a place in my career where I felt pretty comfortable, pretty confident. I'm 2018, I guess I was working as a therapist. Um, also I had, um, earned my, um, certification as a personal trainer and a nutrition coach. And so I was doing that on the side. So I had that, I built that business and I had that going on and, and I was feeling really, really good and really sort of settled into my life. Um, and I, I started just having this feeling of like, I'm not sure if I'm really living my purpose. I felt like there was something else. I felt like I was really close, but I wasn't really, sh- I wasn't quite there yet. And then I started kind of looking around and I, I was like, I feel like all of these are just pieces of the puzzle that I keep collecting. Collecting and I've just, they're all sitting in front of me and I have to figure out how to put it all together um, in a way that's going to make me feel like I'm giving the most of myself to the world and sharing my gifts in the way that they're supposed to be shared. And um, and so that's kind of what what made me pivot into, into coaching. Um, I've, I was frustrated working as a therapist because 
um, a, you know, therapy still has a huge stigma attached to it for a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people can't afford therapy without going through their insurance. But in order to have your insurance pay for your therapy, you have to have a diagnosis. And for a lot of people, that's really, really scary. And I think is it's super frustrating for me because I don't think everyone needs a diagnosis. Um, so I felt like I was kind of hamstrung in helping people the way that I wanted to help them with that. And so, um, so I, I started to learn a little bit more about coaching. Plus I wanted to include what I had learned about the physical side of, of us and kind of combine all of that together, because I think mental, mental health and wellness is goes hand in hand with, with physical health and wellness. And so I wanted to be able to talk to people about their entire lives holistically and, and kind of help guide them. And I wanted to work with people who were out of the stage of kind of digging into the whys and were, in, were ready to do something different and kind of in that action phase. Um, and so that, that sort of took me um, to coaching, which is where I am now. And I feel so, I feel energized. I love, I, I love working with people. I love, helping people see themselves in a different way, helping people see their lives in a different way and, and empowering them to, to do something different and be a different and, and more complete version of themselves and the version that they really see for themselves and that they've always wanted to be. And maybe never, maybe they weren't able to see it, um, but helping them see that. Take that step, right? Because I think all of us have some fire in us to do more or and not even do more, but be more of ourselves mm-hmm. and we step more into our power and true essence. But the more we walk along that path, the scarier it gets sometimes. Yes. yes. I think the, the, the beginning is kind of scary because it's like, Oh, I'm doing something different. Right. But like, I think that that's like a baby step looking back. Cause I know I was terrified stepping into my calling, but got there. And then I feel like you have so many other leaps and bounds you have to make along the way. Yes. How do you keep going? How do you, I don't even want to say stay motivated, right? But how do you trust the process when the process does not give you very <laughs> details. Right. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. I, I think for me, it was just this sense of, I wanted to, you know, I found myself getting older and I just really, I don't like regrets and I don't like leaving things undone. And I don't like feeling like, I don't like what ifs. And I think that's what, that was sort of what motivated me is just like, I don't, I don't want to be at the end of my life or the end of my career and think, gosh, I really wish, you know, I, I, I really feel like I could have done more. And, um, and I, I, I really, I guess maybe kind of pride myself on, on being fearless a little bit in that way of just, you know, the, the more something scares me, the more I want to do it. Yeah. So you're, you're like, 10% of the population. (laughs) Yes. Right. And so I think, you know, but I think it's, it, I think it is what you said is just like having that faith and that belief in yourself and having a faith in the plan. I mean, I think if you've gotten the vision or the calling and you're really clear on what that calling is, I think just even meditate, just meditating on that and keeping yourself grounded in that calling, like, okay, I wouldn't, and understanding that you wouldn't have the calling if it wasn't real. And if that was not your path, you wouldn't have that calling. You would not have the drive to do that. So, you know, the path doesn't have to be clear. You don't have to know it. You just have to believe that there is a path and you're going to just take the, do the next right thing. Take the next step. That's something that's all you can do. Like this is okay. This is what's next. Don't know what's coming after that. Not going to worry about what's coming after that. I'm going to worry about this next step. And then when I get there, I'll worry about the next step after that. And so I think, you know, you said a word that I have a, a, a really interesting relationship with the word motivation because motivation is fleeting and fickle and it does not last. The, the way that you change is with discipline. Yeah. And that's what gets you to where you want to go because you're not going to be motivated. I don't want to do all the things that I have to do every day in order to build my business and do the things that I need to do. But I, I know that if I want to continue to, 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 
feel like I'm living my purpose and, and, and having this calling and being the best version of myself, there are some things that I have to do whether I want to do it or not. And that's where the discipline comes in of like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And this is where, that's also where um, kind of knowing yourself comes in and, and providing the structure that you need that's uniquely yours to get you where you want to go. I know I'm not a morning person, so I'm not going to set up a whole bunch of stuff at five o'clock in the morning. You're not going to get the best Darlene at five in the morning. <laughs> You know, so to, I think tune in to who you are, what you are, yes, what you are, but then, like you said, that discipline is key. And I think there's a balance though, of knowing, you know, what I am today and then who I want to be tomorrow mm -hmm. and then setting up the habits and having the discipline to get there. And yeah. one of the things, um, from James Clear's book, um, Atomic Habits, that I really like that he says is, you know, what would the person that you want to be do? Set yourself up, mm -hmm. not thinking about like, oh, this is what I, like all of these habits or things that I have to do. Like, think about who you want to be mm -hmm. and embody that. So like the clear is like, if you're like working on quitting smoking, for example, like you're not quitting smoking, you're I'm not a smoker anymore. Or like mm -hmm. if someone who is trying to lose weight, it's not like I'm trying to lose weight. I am a fit person. I'm mm -hmm. a person on my fitness journey. Yeah. And when you have that label, because a lot of times we like mix and mold ourselves according to the labels that like society has given us or what we right. think about ourselves. And we act in accordance with that. You see it all the time with kids. With, so yeah. he's like, this is a good kid. This is a bad kid. And so the bad kid, quote unquote, does disruptive things. And the good right. kid is like, okay, I'm good. So I get good grades mm -hmm. and I do these things. Label yourself if it serves you yes. for your purpose, but don't stick to those labels. Right. And having people around you, I think that that is, um, that's key to with, with any kind of growth that you're going to have. And, and even with confidence, when we're talking about confidence is having the right people around you, the people who are going to encourage you to be that person, to continue to grow the people who see that person already sometimes when you can't. And sometimes that's where, you know, I know confidence should come from inside, but sometimes, you know, for me anyway, my confidence comes from thinking about the way other people in my life see me. And, you know, if they see this person, then, you know, maybe my view is a little skewed and maybe they're right. So I'm going to be the person that they see me as. And until I believe that I'm that person too, until I feel like I'm that person too. So I think that that's a really, especially for women, I don't know if it's, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say, especially for women, it, it seems that way to me. Um, when you have those kinds of women in your life, um, that really continue to build you up and to hold a mirror in front of you and really show you who you are and who you can be, um, when you forget, I think that's really, I think that's really key. Yeah. No, the village is everything. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your journey because a, one huge part of your story was your move to California, yes. which to you publishing a book, which was co-authored at least in part by your ex-husband. And I want to know, how do you go from divorce to friends to <laughs> taking on a project like that and doing it with grace and ease? Um, yeah. Um, uh, so 2019, um, have our, our daughter I'm divorced at that point for nine years, um, rocky divorce at the beginning. And we had made our way to being friends, I would say by 2019, um, co-parented really well together at that point. Our daughter was 12. Um, and you know, life was good. We were kind of in Cincinnati and everything was fine. Um, and then one day at one of her swim meets, he was like, so what would you think about maybe moving to California? We were in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> And he's like, I have a great job opportunity in Los Angeles and I really want to take it. Um, you know, I know I can't, you know, I know you're not going to let her go without you. Um, and so, I, but I, I don't want to be without her. I don't want, I want to be able to consistently be in her life. So would you consider moving to California? Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, wow, okay, that's, huge, you know, a like a lot of people wouldn't move down the street if their ex asked them to, and you're asking me to move across the country. Um, so I had to really think about that. And at the end of the day, it came down to um the fact that it was not about me. 
It wasn't about him either. It was really about what was best for our daughter. And what was best for her was to have both of us be a consistent presence in her life. And if that meant that I needed to sacrifice the life that I had in Cincinnati and the, the, the comfort and the security that I had there, which was very, you know, I had a wonderful life in Cincinnati that I had no intention of, of leaving and disrupting at that point. Um, but for her, I would. And for yeah. her, I did. you know, a lot of people were like, I can't believe you moved for your ex. And I said, I didn't, I moved for my daughter. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so as we moved, um, you know, we got settled and, you know, when you move to a new place, you're meeting all these new people. And so the inevitable question of, well, what brought you to Los Angeles? And I was like, well, funny story. <laughs> um, so um, I having more and more conversations and people asked the question that you asked, how in the world did you get to a place where he would even ask you that and that you would actually say yes. And, um, and I started to reflect on that and realize that there was a lot of things that happened along the journey of our, you know, nine year divorce, nine, 10 year divorce at that point that I felt like could really be helpful for other people. Um, and, and the lessons that I learned along the way, I didn't do everything right to be clear, (laughs) but I did learn some, some good lessons along the way. And, um, and so I decided to write a book about, um, our co-parenting journey and, and really how to stay on the high road when it comes to co-parenting. Um, divorce is hard. Divorce is really, really hard. Co-parenting is hard. Um, and, and it feels so good sometimes to just be petty and be wrapped up in our own feelings. And it's hard sometimes to remember, who it's really about. Um, and that's, and that's, so that's really what the book is about. And, um, I, I went to him, I started writing the book and, and I went to, to, um, Sammy's dad and said, Hey, so I'm, I'm writing this book. And, um, I gave him the first couple of chapters that I'd finished at the, that point. Cause I wanted him to know that it wasn't some salacious tell all book about, you know, airing our dirty laundry. I was like, you know, there, there's enough, everybody knows that divorce is hard and, and it and gets ugly, but I wanted to put something in the world that just shows that shows people, um, the good side of it and the things that we did right. And the, you know, the ways that we got it right and the ways that we're continuing to try to get it right for our daughter. Um, and so I gave him the first couple of chapters and I said, Hey, would you consider writing the foreword to the book? And he was like, absolutely a hundred percent. And so he, he wrote the foreword to the book, which was amazing. And, um, and then our daughter who's now 16, um, 15 at the time wrote the afterward to the book. So it was, it was nice way to kind of bookend our story. I felt like it was a good reflection of, um, where we are now, because, you know, at the end of the day, divorced or not, we're still a family, um, Mm -hmm. different family than we, either one of us ever thought it was going to look like, but it's still a family. And we figured out how to function as a family that in the way that's going to be the best for all three of us and going to bring out the best in all three of us. And, um, yeah, so that's been a a big journey. And so, um, the book also sort of changed the focus of my coaching. And so now I'm I'm really working, focusing on coaching people, um, to be the best parents and co-parents they can be, um, and using some of the lessons about taking the high road. And there's, um, you know, four pillars of co-parenting in the book and, and 15 hard won wisdoms and kind of trying to put those things into place and helping people figure out um, a path for themselves that makes sense for their families um, and, and helps them protect their peace as at the same time being a really good co-parent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you said, we all know that divorce is really hard. Like whether you've been through one, seen yeah. one, like whatever your experience of it, just seen it in a movie, right. you know, you're mourning the loss of a relationship. And it's a lot of people compare it to like grieving a person. A hundred percent. It's a death. It's a death of the dreams that you had for your family. It's a, it's, it's a death. And that's, I, I think that people beat themselves up by about not getting over it and being okay, because they feel like they don't, they shouldn't be, be mourning and grieving. But I think that that's one of the big things give, is giving yourself the the space and grace to do that. Yeah. So I want to ask, how do you do that? And you mentioned protecting your peace throughout that process. What advice or tips can you give for protecting your peace throughout a divorce or breakup? And not just from the other person, but like Mm -hmm. internally with yourself when you're left with your own thoughts. Yes. Um, You know, have, you know, having a good support system around you, I think is, is key, but honestly, um, talking to a therapist, 
talking to a therapist, that was the thing that really, that really helped me. And, you know, it was interesting as a therapist, I, uh, you know, I didn't even realize how, what a hole I was in at first yeah. I was, I was coming home every day and dropping her off at school and coming home and pulling the covers over my head until it was time to pick her up. And I did that for a good month. And then I was like, wait a second, <laughs> I don't think I'm okay. And I think being able to just, um, accept the fact that, that it is a loss and that you are mourning and that you're not okay. And being able to admit that, you know, I'm not okay. And I don't have to be okay because this is really hard. Um, and I, I need, I need some support and figuring out what that support looks like, whether it's a therapist, maybe if you're, you know, for some people, maybe it's a clergy person or, or, or whatever, but, um, reaching out for those supports and, and, and treating, um, treating the breakup, like, like a loss, like, as like, like the loss that it is and, um, and giving yourself permission to, to grieve that, giving yourself permission to feel whatever it is that you're feeling. Cause you're going to feel everything <laughs> from, you know, anger and sadness and all of those things. And just giving yourself permission to, to feel all of those things and to, um, and then the time to work through that and not putting yourself on some sort of timetable, like, Oh, it's been a month now. I should be fine. No, not necessarily. Um, so yeah, just, um, yeah, take, doing the things that you've always done to kind of take care of yourself and remember who you are. Um, I think sometimes that gets lost too. When we lose a relationship, we lose this title sometimes, and it feels, it can feel like a loss of an identity. And so we need to take that time to figure out, okay, who am I now? You know, and and it, am I, you know, we can't really go back. I don't, I don't really like when people say, well, I want to get back to me. No, everything that you go through changes who you are. So you're not, there's no getting back on a molecular level. Not even just like we think about, Oh, I'm a different, you're like physically even a different person. Absolutely. And you carry all of that with you. So there's no going back to who I was before the relationship. No, who am I going to be now? I went through this experience and what did I learn? What have I gained? Because that's the other thing. When we go through this, we always are focusing on what we've lost. Um, but we're gaining something and we have to figure out what that is. And so what have I gained and how can I take that moving forward to, to grow and to be better and to be, you know, this, this new different changed version of myself that has learned some valuable lessons and, and is going to move through the world a little differently. Um, and being okay with that, you know, sometimes it's hard to let go of that, especially if the breakup was not of your choosing. Um, and, and it's scary to think about, you know, who am I going to be now and where am I going to go now? And what does this mean? Um, but maybe embracing that too, as opposed to, um, when we moved to California, um, I would do a check-in with my, over the course of our, our move, I was constantly checking in with my daughter because she was, you know, kind of rocked her world, you know, to, to find out that we were moving across the country. And so I was kind of daily almost doing these check-ins. And I said, well, I said, you know, all of your emotions are like a pie. So let's divide the pie. Like, are you like, what percentage are you happy or sad or scared or excited or whatever? And so we would kind of do these check-ins and we, she started, we was, she started talking about how she was um, very nervous and apprehensive and scared. And I said, well, um, I said, that's kind of the, those emotions are all, it's all about the way that you're framing that emotion because that ball of emotion, if you think about how changes, what the change is going to look like in your and you're, you're focused on all of the things that you're losing and leaving behind and, and you're focusing on the unknown of what's going on in a negative way, then you are going to feel scared and, and apprehensive. I said, but if you can flip that on the other side and think what could possibly happen? It's like, what's going to happen versus what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like it could be anything. And so I said, if you look at it through that lens, then it's excitement. Then it's like anticipation. It's like this, this could be this, this huge, big thing. And so I think being able to shift that shift your focus into, you know, what, what is coming next and being excited about what's coming next. That is so real. I remember um, a few years back when I had gotten out of a really horrible breakup and I was like, it rocked my world. And I was just like, so sad all the time, (laughs) like alone, because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So you can't even go outside and like (sighs) get a drink with girlfriends. I'm just like here at home alone, (laughs) couch and crying in bed and like crying on my way to the kitchen to get a snack. 
And in that moment though, I also realized like, I'm really sad right now and I'm going through it right now, Mm -hmm. but I am so excited for what is on the other end of this. And I think like just that knowing, right? Like I I didn't know how I was going to get through it. I didn't know, you know, what was going to be on the other side or like what, like what transformation would happen because I was going through, it wasn't just a breakup. There was so many, like we talk about the transformation of identity. Mm -hmm. I my job and had gone to be a consultant for the full time, um, full time for myself. Um, so many different things were happening, uncovering childhood trauma. It's like one thing after the other. And so you're just hit and then you left the house by yourself to deal with it. Oh my gosh. Emotion. <laughs> Help me. Um, yes. But just knowing that, um, I don't know what is on the other side, but I am so excited for it. Because right. you don't have to know the right. future is what you make it. And it's based off of what you do right now. And so you can cry your tears, you can feel bad, but you have to keep going. And you have to frame that, like you said, with this air of enthusiasm and optimism of what's to come, because that's what's going to ultimately pull you through. And then calling in your support systems, your counselors, your, your friends, whatever that looks like for you, I think is so cr- crucial. Yes, absolutely. And just, yeah, I, I love that, the, just the sense of the sense of excitement. And you said, you know, say, thinking, remembering and thinking that I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You don't have to know. You just have to know that you are going to get through it. That is, an, that is an, a done deal. You will get through it. You don't have to know how, but you will. And on the other side of that, it's going to be. Right. I think a lot of people, like you talk all the time, like, I don't know how I'm going to go on. I don't know. Like, it's okay. You don't get have up to tomorrow. Do. That's all you got to do. Yeah. You go from there. <laughs> how, like, how can we just be like 1% better? Yes. Each day? So we talked a bit about your book, but it's one thing to, you know, rise above the fray when it comes to co-parenting because you have this person, this amazing human that you're doing it for. But what about the other people in your life where you just kind of want to be petty? How do you... <laughs> take the high road in those situations too, because your book is about taking the high road. So how do we do that across the board? Um, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. I think, you know, I guess I think that I, I try to think about um, how, how much energy I have and where I want to spend my energy. The older I get, the more protective I get of my energy. And I understand that, um, that it's, you know, like, like you have a cup every day and this is your energy for the day. And where am I going to, you know, what buckets am I going to put this cup in and understanding that every day your cup is not full. (laughs) Some days your cup is only three quarters full. So that's all you've got to give. So where are you going to put that limited amount of energy? We don't have a finite amount of energy. And I think, especially as women, sometimes we feel like we need to, and we're trying to do everything and be everything and be perfect in all of these different ways think, and, and thinking that we're not, never going to burn out and we're going to burn out. And so just respecting the fact that we only have a finite amount of energy and, you know, where do I want to put that energy and who do I want to be? Ultimately, you know, everyone that you meet, everyone that you encounter has their own um, perception of you you know what I mean? And, and, and so who, who do I want to be? And I, I try to be, and I think that it's a good thing to try to be consistent across the board, consistent across, you know, who I am. And if I don't want to be this petty person with my mom or my sister or my best friend, then I'm not going to be this petty person with this woman that, you know, that I work with at the office who gets on my nerves and I just want to punch in the throat. I'm not going to do that because if I'm trying to be, you know, this consistent person across the board, then I'm going to, I'm going to have to let that go. Um, but it's, it, but it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> It's so hard. And I think also just like, you know, I I ask myself oftentimes, like, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. is this, is this conversation worth it? Is this confrontation worth it? What do I want? Like if there's a confrontation or a conversation that might be difficult that I'm like feeling like I need to say something or I need to have, I pause and I'm like, what do I want to happen from this conversation? What am I, what am I trying to get from this conversation? And if I'm honest with myself and I'm like, I want this person to, you know, take responsibility for this and give me an apology. And then my next question is, do you really think you're going to get that? If you don't, 
you're done. Yeah. Why give it the energy? You're not going to get what you want. So now you're going to have had this petty moment and this awful conversation, and you're still going to feel like crap at the end on the other side of it. So what was the point of that? You've wasted all of this emotional energy on this thing that doesn't even really matter at the end of the day. You know what I mean? And so I think that it's so hard though, to take that step back and to not get wrapped up in the moment. But again, you know, it's just like, you know, I have this moment now kind of that, what is your relationship to now? I think I have this moment now. I have this amount of energy. Do I want to, is this worth giving it my energy? Most of the time, the answer is probably no. No, that's so true. (laughs) I like how you um, brought it back to the now though, because even if you could have the same conversation with that person tomorrow and get a way different outcome, understanding like where you are right now, where they are and like what will serve you best. Yes. But there's like, who is this person? Are they ever going to give me what I want? But also, right. is this even the time to have this? Because I know that this is a reasonable person, right. but we're both in the heat of the moment right now. Right. He's slick at the mouth. So might they, and maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we just need a little breather. Yes. Yes. Knowing, and that's where knowing yourself comes in. You know, I think, you know, being able to, to take a step back and go, you know, I, I'm not at my best right now. So maybe this is not a conversation that I need to have right now. And, you know, not even thinking about them because that's an unknown quantity that we can't control, but, you know, I'm not at my best right now. So I might say something that I, you know, would regret or don't necessarily mean, and I'm not necessarily showing up in this moment as the me that I want to be. And I think that's it too, is like thinking about, you know, who, who you are in that moment. Am I being the me that I, that I aspire to be every day? You know, we're not, it's not, it's not perfect. I'm not sitting here, believe me, I'm not sitting here trying to say that I'm never petty (laughs) and I I don't venture off the high road because I definitely do. But, um, you know, but you know, we're just, we're trying, we're all doing our best. Yeah. And that's all we can do. It's about progress not perfection. Exactly. In addition to working with parents, families, and across the fitness spectrum, you also coach individuals um, and institutions to help them understand their strengths and really play to their strengths. So when we are feeling lost or low on confidence, how do you suggest that we tap into our power? Um, I think from a lot of us, we're not even, we don't, focus on what our strengths are. I think uh, oftentimes if you ask someone, if you just out of the blue, ask someone what their strengths are, um, they won't really know. If you said, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? People will always answer what their weaknesses are first. Always, almost always, especially women, almost always. And, and that list will probably be longer than their strengths. Um, so I think that we have to give ourselves permission first to really under know and understand what our strengths are, you know, and really begin to see how those make us uniquely wired to be this, this person with these specific gifts that nobody else has. Yeah. And, um, and, and really um, embrace that, you know, and just, you know, embrace our uniqueness and embrace the fact that um, yeah, all of nobody else, the, there, nobody else can be me. Nobody else has these in, even if somebody is somewhat similar to you, I have an identical twin sister. We are very, very different. There are a lot of ways that we are the same, but I am still very uniquely me. And there are some things and that I can offer people and offer the world that she can't and vice versa. And so, um, you know, being able to, to embrace that really to, and to learn what your strengths are. And I mean, I use the Clifton strengths finder to, to work with people when I do my strengths coaching, but, um, there's, you know, all kinds of things. And, and sometimes it's asking the people around you too, you know, what they think your strengths are. But I think that's where it first comes is just naming those and getting really comfortable with saying, you know, this is, you know, empathy is my number one strength. And I have fought that for a long time and I didn't really want to embrace it because I felt like it made me weak, but it's not, it's your strengths are your superpower. And the more you understand them, the more you can use them as your superpower. And so that's why I think it's, it's really crucial for people to really get to understand what their strengths are, um, because the more that you embrace them, the more powerful you become in using them. No, I love, I love that. And I know that you also have a very interesting way. And I love what you said about weaknesses. 
because you have your a whole different way of framing that. So tell us about how yes. you your weakness. Yeah, your weakness isn't something that you're bad at. Your weakness is a misuse of your strength. And so like for me, like I said, empathy is sort of my number one strength. A misuse of that is not being able to set up clear boundaries with people. Um, and so that would be a weakness. So it's like, it's the dark side of what, um, of what your, of what your strength is. And so that's, again, the other reason that we have to understand our strengths, because if we don't understand that, then we can't understand that dark side. And then we start, we, we continue to make these decisions and do these things and see these patterns that are not serving us. And we're like, I don't understand why this is still happening. Um, because we haven't really understood that this is, you know, this is a, a flip side of something that is really a good strength for us. And if we learn to use that, then we can mitigate that dark side and, and that weakness, so to speak. Can you give us an example of how we can like tactically do that? So maybe using empathy as an example or another common like strength. Now I'm trying to think of another one. I, I talk about empathy a lot because it's just, it's always on the t- at the top of my, um, I, so I guess, I mean, I, we can stay on that, on that example. Um, but I, I think that for me, when I, when I started to dig into this idea of weaknesses being um, a misuse of a strength, um, it's hard because I felt like I was being called out because I, you know, I started to kind of think about, you know, like what happens if it's like, what happens if this strength, if this strength goes too far, like what happens if empathy goes too far? And I was like, I, the first time I, somebody said something about, well, you know, what about boundary issues? And I was like, I, I can set up clear boundaries. And then I was like, mm, can you though? <laughs> Is that your strength? Not so much. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think, you know, thinking about, um, maybe looking at some of the patterns in your life that have not served you well, some of the things that, you know, decisions that you've made that you feel like you've, you've kept making over and over again, and really diving into those, like, okay, what is that? What's that about? What's, what's behind that? Um, you know, getting, feeling like, um, I was, I used to always say that I was just like super gullible and people always took advantage of me. Well, that was the flip side of this. Like, I just wanted to connect with everyone and wanted to make people feel understood. So yeah, that was, you know, this sort of openness and I'm like, and, and understanding that like a boundary is not a bad thing. A boundary is a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, I don't know. That's a, it's, it's a hard one because I think you really have to just put a really hold a mirror up in front of you (laughs) and, and look at, you know, the things that you've decisions that you've made and things that you've done, um, that, you know, that haven't been working for you and where those are coming from. Yeah. And I think that, like you said, that can be really uncomfortable to do so uncomfortable and we, we don't want to call ourselves out. No, no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's no fun. That's no fun. No one wants to do that. <laughs> no, yeah. but once we are able to really sit with ourselves, we unlock the door to true confidence. Yes. I, confidence isn't just being able to sit with yourself and say, Hey, I'm great. It's mm. being able to accept yourself flaws and all. Yes. Understand the root of what some of those flaws may be mm-hmm. and then love yourself enough to work through them. Yeah. And giving yourself grace, I think is a huge piece of confidence too. I think, um, I know for me, that is a huge challenge. Honestly, if I'm being totally honest, still a big challenge for me is giving myself the grace to not be good at everything and to not have it all figured out and to, you know, to the grace, because when you give yourself grace, you're also giving yourself space to grow because if you're constantly, um, being negative and kind of judging yourself about all of these things that you're doing wrong and you haven't quite figured out yet, there's no room for growth in that area. Um, but being able to say, okay, you know, and giving yourself that, that grace is, is the space to, that's where your confidence grows. I think. Yeah. I love that you, you frame it like that because it truly does give yourself space. And I, I think of the example of just being tired, right. And this is not the best example, but it like, it's what happens to me most often. And I will be exhausted and work myself into the ground and still have, you know, a million things on my to-do list and feel like I need to power through rather than giving myself the grace to just go to sleep, knowing that you cannot do everything. Right. That's so hard. (laughs) 
Um, but also what it can go back to even just the characteristics or innate qualities of ourselves, knowing that, you know, we are who we are on an intrinsic level and it's okay that you're not perfect. You will never be perfect. Right. Be perfectly imperfect. Yeah. I always think it's so powerful when I hear someone speak about themselves and kind of share, um, a, not a limitation, but really, I guess, share something that they know about themselves that, that helps them be their best self. Like when you were talking about that, like I have a, a, a really good friend and she's very clear about like who she is and what she needs to be her best. And she's very, and she's like, you know, I need my sleep. And we can be out. She's like, you know what? I've got a lot of things to do tomorrow. And I know that I need this particular amount of sleep. And so as much as I love you guys, I'm going home because I need to be my best self tomorrow. And I know that I'm not my best self if I don't get my eight hours. See you later. And, you know, instead of just kind of being swooped up and and just, you know, kind of like you said, sort of wanting to do everything and be everything and not missing out on anything, but just being really so confident in who she is and and knowing who she is and what she needs and being able to, to do that for herself and to, to give that to herself, to advocate for herself in that way um, is really, I'm, I'm just always kind of amazed and, and just impressed with people who can do that. Yeah. And for, and kind of going off on a tangent here, but for all of our sleepless souls that are listening, because <laughs> I have a lot of entrepreneurs and people who are like burning the midnight oil. Yes. It is crazy what eight hours of sleep can do. Like insane. Like and a good person. Anything that like no one's ever heard before, but I've been trying it. <laughs> it <laughs> really a, is. It transforms yeah. your life. And so I think just whether it's game changer. or just loving yourself as you are. I love that. Just give yourself grace to be. Yeah. Grace to be messy. We're all messy. So messy. Life's yeah. messy. <laughs> messy is beautiful. You know, I just, I, I, what I tell my daughter that all the time. I also tell her sleep is magic. That's one of my favorite things to say. And I, because I honestly do believe that literally like anything that is going wrong, anything that is bad in your life, get a little, what, when you ha- are rested, you're going to look at it differently. It's going to look different. So whether that be a nap, whether that be a good night's sleep, it's not going to fix it. It's not going to change it. It's going to change you and your ability to deal with and handle whatever is in front of you. If you are sleepy and tired and irritable, whatever is in front of you is going to be a million times worse. It just is. And so that's why I would tell my daughter, she's like, she was complaining about something. I was like, you know what? Let's just take a nap. Sleep is magic. I promise you when you wake up from your nap, you will feel better about it. I promise. I don't believe you. I promise. And so I remember this so clearly. She was like eight and she woke up and, um, and I don't even remember what it was that was going on, but she wakes up from her nap and then she's gone to play and she comes downstairs and she goes, you know what, mom, you were right. Sleep is magic. I feel a lot better. <laughs> just turned around and walked out of the room. <laughs> it was like mission accomplished. My work is done here. <laughs> In addition to sleep, how can we do a better job of taking care of ourselves on a day-to-day basis? Um, I mean, it sounds, it sounds so cliche, but you know, drinking your water and, you know, fueling your body with good stuff, you know, as much as I am the biggest sugar addict in the history of ever. Um, but I know that I feel better when I don't need a lot of it. You know, it's like, it's, I'm not, I'm not a person that says deprive yourself of things. There's cupcakes in my, in my kitchen right now. Um, but, um, just being aware and getting to learn your, learn yourself and know what makes you operate at your best, you know what I mean? And giving those things to yourself. And I think also, um, being intentional about the surroundings, the way that, you know, like whether it be your house, the people that you surround yourself with, everything that is, that you're bringing in and taking in um, really affects who you are and how you feel and how you move through the world and how you work. And so, um, you know, I know that I function better when my house is clean and tidy. Like it just makes me feel better. I just, I don't do well with clutter and chaos. And so making it a point to do that, you know, make, I know that I'm a person who really needs friend time to feel very grounded and to feel connected. And when I don't, and I can tell when I don't, when I don't have that. And so making that a priority and making, making time to do that. And that's going to be different for everybody. Um, but making the time to do the things that, you know, keep you feeling 
the most grounded and the most you, you know, I feel better when I get up and take my walk every morning. And sometimes I get, I veer off the path and I know that, and I can feel it. I'm like, Ooh, I haven't really been doing my walks and I feel it. I just feel a little bit kind of, I don't know, flighty a little bit. And so I just, you know, just really thinking about, you know, what things make me feel grounded and making those a priority and making those like non-negotiables. Yeah. I think it's so important to make it a non-negotiable and to schedule, be intentional about scheduling the time. Yeah. Self-love because when life gets busy and things get in the way, self-care usually is the first thing that we take off of the table. Yes. A (laughs) hundred percent. We're like, I'm fine. Yeah. No, you're not fine. That's like the kiss of death. We're actually not my daughter. I, we banned that word. Neither one of us is allowed to say fine. If somebody asks, if one of the, if the other asks how they're doing, we're not allowed to say fine. It was like, both of us have big enough vocabularies that we can find a better word. And usually when you say fine, it's not fine. So we're going to find a better word, and a more accurate word to how we're feeling. So we're not allowed to say fine. <laughs> I love that you've given us so many gems literally over the course of like 45 minutes before I let you go. Do you have any final words of wisdom? Um, gosh, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, I get when you said that initially, my favorite quote just sort of came to mind and I don't necessarily, it's not necessarily, I guess, about something that you do for yourself, but I get, it's just, it's the way that I live my life, I guess. And that's just, and I really like the idea of leave people better than you found them. And sometimes that just means saying, smiling and saying hi, but you know what I mean? And just being nice because, because just because, um, because this person is in front of you, but I just, I don't know when I, when I think about that and when I'm really living that, I just, there's just a sense of joy in me. I think it, you, cause it, you're, you're, you're pouring out into other people, but it's, it's coming back to you as well. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to explain. I mean, I feel like it sounds very just like simple and kind of Pollyanna-ish, but, uh, but that's, but that's truly how I, that's truly how I, how I live. And I think that, you know, but doing that, it just, it gives something back to you as well. So, and we need more of that. So. No, I love that. And I think when we give of ourselves, and are intentional about giving to others and making them better or helping just be a kind word. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, we're drawing that energy. We're manifesting that back to ourselves. And it's a very simple thing that we can do to make the world a better place. Yep. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it.